Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from April 12th, 2020. Join us for a study in the Book of Acts with Pastor Dax. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. Actually, as you're turning there, I was reminded, I was reading this morning in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, and it said, uh, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in my spirit. Uh, and that's part of my prayer for this morning, too, that even though we are not physically together, that we are spiritually present together, even as the spirit dwells in us and among us. So Acts chapter 2, this morning I want to look at uh, a few lines from the first Christian sermon ever preached by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to read just a brief excerpt from that sermon, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This is God's word. Lord, help us to understand this message. Help us also to receive this message. Just as Peter desired that his audience would respond to this message, so I pray that we too would respond in such a way that we would be changed. Amen. Today's Easter. It's a pretty big deal for Christians. It's a pretty hard day, too, since we're unable to gather. Uh, one of the things I think I miss today is I love on this day in particular to stand in front of the church and say, he is risen, and hear the exuberant response of everybody gather here reply, he is risen indeed. But the truth is, for Christians, the resurrection is so important that it can't be contained in a single day anyway. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to why and how Christians live. As a matter of fact, it's the only way that all people may truly live, both in this life and in the life to come. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the great hope and victory of the Christian. But the resurrection of Jesus doesn't make much sense apart from the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus doesn't make much sense apart from the life of Jesus. And so in this sermon from Acts chapter 2, those are the three major points. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And how we are supposed to respond to it. So in verse 22, Peter begins by speaking briefly about the life of Jesus. He says, men of Israel, Israel, that's the people of God, the people of promise, the people whom God had chosen, whom God had made a nation and given the law and the covenants and the hope of a coming Messiah. Peter is addressing his people, the people of whom he is a part and he's saying to them, you people whom God has given great privilege, hear these words. Sometimes, isn't it true, though, that the people who should be the very first to understand something are the very same people who miss it altogether. Almost like they're too close to it. It can be right in front of you, but you can't quite see it. You can't quite grasp it. I think most of us have experienced that. Even when it comes to God's word, we can miss what God is saying. And so Peter is speaking here to people who should have known. Men of Israel, hear these words. He's saying, listen 
carefully. And these same words that Peter spoke to his audience on that day should also resonate in our ears and in our hearts. We need to listen carefully to what is being said here. We need to grasp the significance of these words and feel their weight and trust in these truths. Maybe you're, you're watching or listening this morning simply because it's Easter and you feel like that's what you should do. Maybe you're hoping that you can soothe a guilty conscience and it's a little bit easier to do than normal because you can do it on your couch. Maybe you've tuned in hoping for a significant encounter with God. Or maybe you're stuck listening to this right now because you're trapped in a house with somebody else who's watching it. I don't know your reason for listening to this message. But since you are listening, please pay careful attention to what Peter is about to say to us. Hear these words. Continuing in verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, was delivered up and died and rose again. Notice, Jesus of Nazareth. This, this man isn't some myth or fantasy or legend. He has a real name, Jesus. He lived in a real historical place, Nazareth. And it is this Jesus that Peter is talking about to the people of Israel. Not just some guy named Jesus that you might have heard about. Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, you remember him. Joseph and Mary's son. The carpenter. You saw what God did in and through him. He wasn't a myth. He wasn't a figment of our imagination. And our Christian faith isn't a myth either. It's real. It's historical. It happened. And this is why we have hope. As Paul writes in Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Because the central claim of Christianity is that there is forgiveness of sins only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if he hasn't been raised, that means there is no forgiveness of sins. We are still in our sins and we will perish eternally. No, friends, it's important to state that our faith is a historical faith. And Jesus is a real person. And so Peter says to his audience here, effectively, I'm talking to you about Jesus of Nazareth. And then he says, a man attested to you by God. He's saying, you were here when it happened. This, this didn't take place in a corner. You saw it with your own eyes. God demonstrated that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, the Son of God, one with the Father. And how did God prove those claims? Peter says, Jesus was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. So God demonstrated that this real historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, is who he claimed to be through a myriad of amazing miracles. Feeding 5,000 people at once with two loaves and five fish. That demonstrated who Jesus was. Not just a, a compassionate human being, but also the sovereign Lord over all. Quieting a raging storm with a spoken word. Casting out demons. Healing the sick. Raising the dead. He had power like no one else. All of these incredible miracles, they serve one primary purpose, to testify to the fact that Jesus was God, sent from God. And Peter says, all of these things, God did through him in your midst. This wasn't secondhand information. They didn't hear about these things through the grapevine or uh, on an email forward. Peter is saying, this happened in your presence. You people saw this. You were there. And you know it's true. Do you see that at the end of verse 22? 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. He's saying you know it. It's not that you don't know it. It's not that you're ignorant about it. You know it and you have been resisting it and rejecting it and ignoring it and suppressing it. But the truth is they had seen it. The problem is seeing is not believing. We like to think that seeing is believing. That's why we say things like, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Or we might say of God, if, if God would just show himself to me, or if God would just do what I'm asking him to do, then I would believe in him. And we like to say those kind of things because we think that that puts the pressure on God and takes the pressure off of us. But if scripture is to be trusted, all of scripture bears witness to the fact that seeing is definitely not believing. Think of all the things that the people of Israel saw coming out of Egypt. Think of all the things the people in Jesus' day saw. And maybe a bit more personally for you, think of what you've seen. And yet, perhaps, have still not truly believed. The fact is, we see God at work all the time. But we doubt. We resist. We chalk it up to other things. We say that we want proof. I don't think we really want proof. What we want when we say those kinds of things is an excuse. We want a way out to, to say something like, I'll, I'll believe in you, God, if you would just give me a sign, if you would just do what I ask. But the fact is, all of us know, deep down, that God is. And that he is who he says he is. And we also know that God, being who he is, is not obligated to us in any way. That God isn't very likely to be waiting on pins and needles in heaven and then say, oh, you're commanding me to do something. Let me get right on that. God's not going to do that. And we know that. But we think that if I don't see God act, then I don't have to believe in him. And it becomes an excuse and a weak excuse because God has acted. God has proven himself. God has demonstrated who he is, and he's done it all most magnificently in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see it in his life. He lived a perfectly righteous life that stands in stark contrast to our consistent sinful failings in every area of life. Where we fail as moral beings, Jesus lived in perfect conformity to God's will. He fulfilled all of the law and all righteousness in his sinless life. That's Peter's first point. Now he moves on to the death of Jesus in verse 23. He says, This Jesus, this Jesus, the historical Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, this one, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. We see very clearly here that the death of Jesus was God's plan and God's will. Peter says that Jesus was delivered up like an offering. By whom? Well, it was all according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God the Father wasn't surprised at any of this. He planned it. Jesus wasn't surprised at any of this. It's the reason why he was born, to atone for the sin of his people by dying on the cross. Before time began, our, our triune God made a covenant together to have a people for their own possession. So in the salvation of sinners, God the Father planned that redemption. The Son accomplished that work. And the Spirit applies those saving benefits to God's people. 
And so believers are not only saved from God's wrath, but they are saved to be united to Jesus and to each other. And picking the storyline up from before time began, all through the Old Testament, we can see this promise of one who will come to conquer sin and Satan and death. We see God tell Adam and Eve in the garden, who are broken and shattered by their own sin, he says, one day your offspring will crush the serpent's head. God tells Abraham, one day your offspring will bless the whole world. God tells David, one day a son of yours will reign forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And the prophets go on to speak of a servant who will suffer and die to atone for the sins of, his, of sinful people. And so we look at verse 23 here, and what's Peter saying? Who is responsible for Jesus' death? Who killed Jesus Christ? Well, we know the Roman soldiers bear some responsibility. They killed Jesus, right? Pilate, the Roman governor, had the final say in the matter, and it was Roman soldiers who drove the nails into his hands and feet on the cross. But then again, he was only there in the first place because some of the Jewish leaders handed him over on these falsified charges. They wanted him dead. So the Jews are guilty, along with the Romans, for Jesus' death. But then, of course, as the verse says, overarching all of that, we're told that the death of Jesus was part of God's plan, foreordained, to redeem us from our sin. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 4, just a couple of chapters over, verse 28, we're told that all of these sinful people were acting together to do whatever God's hand and plan had predestined to take place. So all of that is very true and helpful to understand when we're answering the question, who is responsible for Jesus' death? But there's another important fact that you must not lose sight of. And that is that the death of Jesus Christ is on you, believer. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your guilt. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. Who is our? Paul's writing to believers. Christ died for the sins of all who believe in him. Meaning all the wrath that we justly deserve as sinners was poured out on him by the Father and Jesus willingly stepped into that punishment to save us for himself. It's his death. We have his life. We have his death. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with his crucifixion and death. Peter continues now to speak about his resurrection. Verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. God raised Jesus from the dead. He is dead no longer. He lives forever. He ascended to heaven. He sits enthroned in that place. And we believers eagerly await his return. On Friday, his dead body was placed in a tomb. On Saturday, his followers were in complete despair. Now, of all people, they should have understood what was happening. How many times had Jesus told them that he would rise from the dead on the third day? But it was almost like they were so close, they missed it. So they were distraught because their friend and their Messiah was dead. Then you had another group of people who on that Saturday breathed a sigh of relief because Jesus had finally been silenced. Because Jesus had said to the most religious, the most knowledgeable, the most moral people of the day, he told them, you think you're righteous, but in fact, you are wicked 
You're just as bad as the people that you condemn, if not worse. You're guilty. And your only hope for redemption and forgiveness and eternal life is to trust me, to come to me, to follow me, to put me first. That message frustrated those people. And with Jesus in the tomb on Saturday, they could finally breathe. They could finally say, okay, we can get back to normal. How many of us are the same way? Perhaps you open up your Bible and you flip through and you run across these hard things that Jesus says. Love your enemies and pray for them. Forgive others as I have forgiven you. Lay down your life and follow me. You hear these hard things and all you want is for him to be quiet. Because you know that if he's right and that if you have to do these things that Jesus commands, that means your life is going to change. And you don't want that. And so you push him away, content to live in the silence of that Saturday. When Jesus wasn't talking anymore, when he had been shut up. All so that you don't have to respond. So that you can continue to live life your way. But on Sunday... Early in the morning, Jesus rose from the dead, and that changed everything. Now a response is demanded. Nothing will ever be the same again because Jesus rose from the dead. And for believers, because Jesus has risen from the dead, we too now have this hope of resurrected life. And we can know that all of the promises that he made during his time on earth, promises that he will bring righteousness to reign, promises that all of creation will be restored, all of those promises have been made certain by the fact of his resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead, Peter says, because death couldn't even begin to hold him. He says, God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Notice that little phrase, the pangs of death. It means sharp pain. The sharp pains of death were loosened with Jesus' resurrection. They were loosened. Not entirely removed for the time being. Because we still die, don't we? But those pangs of death have been loosened. Pangs like fear. The fact is, death is part of God's curse upon a fallen world. Death is not a good thing. And so we as human beings fear it in some sense. Pangs like sorrow. Because even when we have the hope of resurrection, it still hurts when people that we love die. But because of Jesus' resurrection, these pangs are loosened. Death is a curse from God. We, uh, it's a consequence of our sinful rebellion. We still experience death, but for those who've been raised to new life in Christ, death is truly temporary. It's a mere entrance into God's presence where we find true joy and happiness. And then when Jesus returns, we will be reunited with our bodies, which will no longer be subject to decay, weakness, or sin, and live with him forever. Peter says death couldn't hold him because he holds death. Revelation 1, Jesus says that he holds the keys to death and Hades in his hands. How could death possibly hold the eternal Son of God who has no beginning, no end? In Jesus, the great mystery of, of God is unveiled. He's truly a man, a man who dwelled with us, a man who could be touched and heard and seen. And yet at the same time, he is truly God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent creator of everything. How could death hold him? It's impossible. His resurrection gives us the assurance of life. Life now and life to come. He's raised from the dead, and so we have this resurrection life in him. 
eternal life that begins now. Listen to what Jesus prayed to his father in John 17. If you want a good definition of eternal life, this is a great place to start. Jesus prays, You have given me authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given me. Listen. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and me, whom you have sent. Friend, do you want eternal life? Then you need to know God. Not just know about God. You need to know God intimately and relationally through his son, Jesus. And even greater than your need to know God is your need to be known by God. To be united to him in Christ both now and forever. You can have eternal life now because of Jesus. And the life to come because of his resurrection. That's what today is about. That's what every day is about for the believer. But today, specifically, we celebrate that Christ died for sinners. He rose from the dead to save his people, and ultimately he will make all things new. That's what we celebrate, not just on Easter, but every Sunday. In fact, we live in this reality every single day. Not necessarily by throwing a party, not necessarily by observing some sort of ceremony or ritual. We celebrate this reality. If you jump down in Acts chapter 2, jump down to verse 36. We celebrate this reality because Jesus is our Lord. Look at verse 36. Peter says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. He is Lord. And the only appropriate response is for us to bow our knee and submit to him as Lord. So we see this little bit of Peter's sermon. We see the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus and we do what? Go hunt some eggs? Eat some ham, maybe some jelly beans. Nothing wrong with that. But is that all there is? We've spent time here this morning singing songs, praying, hearing about Jesus, that he lived a perfect, righteous life, that he died on behalf of sinners to provide forgiveness, that he rose from the dead. We hear all this, we nod our heads and... We just go on with our day? Or do we, for once, set aside the time to respond to these truths in such a way that God might change us? Could it be that maybe we ought to slow down to discover and pay attention to how God is working in us through this message to transform us and make us more like Jesus? Because whenever we drink in the good news of the gospel, whether for the first time or the thousandth time, we ought to always be asking this simple question, what do I do now? In light of this, what do I do now? That's exactly the question that Peter's audience asks in verse 37. Look at it. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They're saying to Peter, We, we hear you, Peter. We, we feel the weight of your words. We sense the gravity in all of this. But now we need to know what to do. We need to know how to respond. So, so tell us what to do. And Peter's response is simple. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. What shall we do? That's the question. What shall we do? I hope you're asking that question. 
I pray that all of us listening to this are asking that question. And I know that many of you listening are Christians, and you've been Christians for a long time. But you should never be able to hear the truth of the gospel and not ask yourself, what should I do? Because responding to the gospel is necessary, both right now and at every moment. Peter says we're told here to repent. Repent, it means to, to trust and to turn. Meaning, I, I trust in Christ. Everything that he said, everything that he did, I recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, sent from God, who came to redeem me from my own sin, including all of my misplaced efforts at getting right with God, be that religion or morality or righteous deeds. I say now that Jesus comes first. I trust him above all things. I don't trust in myself, not anymore. I don't trust in how good in him. I don't trust what my heart tells me to do. I stop thinking of myself as the center of the universe, and instead I look to Jesus and I trust him as the only means by which God will accept me. So you trust and you turn because repentance also involves a, a turning away from the self-centered life from the sin in your life and turning towards Jesus Christ to trust him. But the point I want to press on, especially for professing Christians, that this trusting and turning is an ongoing reality. No one has ever trusted in Christ and turned from their sin that one time and then never had to look back. It just doesn't happen that way. You have to trust and turn daily, every day, throughout the day, constantly reminding yourself with the gospel truth that Jesus is first, that Jesus is Lord. And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you. Every one of you. In other words, you need to join with God's people. You need to find unity and fellowship with the people of God. You can't just go out there and do this on your own. You need to come in and be part of God's flock. And baptism is mentioned here because belief and baptism are always very close together in the New Testament. They're not the same thing, but baptism represents what happens when we repent and believe. And so, they always happen very close together. Believe the gospel, repent, trust in Jesus, and be baptized in the local church. Find life today. And Peter says, when we believe this gospel, God acts to forgive our sins, and he gives us the Holy Spirit. Friends, your greatest need, please hear me, your greatest need is the forgiveness of your sins. There's nothing more important. I know it doesn't always feel like that's the most important thing. You've got other things in your life that you feel require more attention. Maybe in these days, more than ever. But trust me when I tell you that there is nothing more important for you than the forgiveness of your sins. It is more important than food or air or water or finding toilet paper. It's more important than this life. You need to be reconciled to the God against whom you have sinned. You probably don't always feel that, but in your more honest moments, you recognize that there is corruption within you. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the good news. In fact, it is the only cure that helps us to see that there is forgiveness. There is a cure for that corruption for all who will believe in this gospel. There's nothing more important than being reconciled to God. It is not based on your works. 
It is not based on ceremonies and rituals. It is not based on your performance. It is not based on how you are doing compared to other people. It is all and only because of the merits of Jesus Christ who died for sinners that you might be forgiven. And Peter says that part of this means that we are given the Holy Spirit. Hebrews says that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. That's the same Spirit who will come to dwell in you the moment you believe, to make you new, to give you a new heart, to enable and empower you to live according to God's ways as the joy of your life. Not that you're made perfect. You will still fail, but the Spirit will be with you. That's the promise, so that as your faith grows, you continue to walk with Jesus and you will persevere in your faith to the end of your life. You'll be used by God to glorify him and to love other people and to make disciples. And then Peter says this in verse 39. For the promise, that is God's gospel promise of forgiveness and the Holy Spirit and redemption, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Is God calling you to himself? Then this promise is for you. Right now. For you. Not for those people. The gospel isn't just for, for those people out there. It's for you. Maybe you see the gospel as something that's a nice add-on for moral people good people. And you know you. You know that you have big problems. You're completely messed up. Your life is backwards. And so you think the gospel's not for me. It's for the good people. Or, or maybe you think, you know what? This gospel thing is for people who are really messed up. The, the people who hate and hurt and steal and murder. They do all the really bad things things I don't do. That's who the gospel's for, not for the relatively good people like me. Is God calling you to himself? Then this gospel is for you. The, the gospel is for the moral and the immoral, for the religious and the irreligious. The gospel is for all who will believe. Jesus lived a sinless life then he died to pay for sin and he rose from the dead so that you might have life now with God and with his people forever. Is God calling you to himself? The only right response? Repent of your sins, trust in Jesus Christ and join the people of God. Will you do that right now? Wherever you're at, If we've learned anything in these recent weeks, it's that we are not promised another day. The future is something we can't predict. But here is good news for everyone who is feeling isolated and secluded and overwhelmed. It is that suffering and disease and viruses and even death does not have the last word. God raised Jesus up, and he has the last word. Easter isn't canceled. Death is canceled. I plead with you, if you've never done it before, to cry out to this Jesus, and he will save you. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.